Hear now the scripture reading from Matthew chapter 22, verses 15 to 22. Then the Pharisees went out and laid plans to trap him in his words. They sent their disciples to him along with the Herodians. Teacher, they said, we know that you are a man of integrity and that you teach the way of God in accordance with the truth. You aren't swayed by others because you pay no attention to who they are. Tell us then, what is your opinion? Is it right to pay the imperial tax to Caesar or not? But Jesus, knowing their evil intent, said, You hypocrites, why are you trying to trap me? Show me the coin used for paying the tax. They brought him a denarius, and he asked them, Whose image is this and whose inscription? Caesar's, they replied. Then he said to them, So give back to Caesar what is Caesar's, and to God what is God's. When they heard this, they were amazed. So they left him and went away. This is the word of God. Thanks be to God. Today, we're happy to welcome the Reverend Meredith Ward to give the message. Reverend Meredith is the pastor of Walking Together, a ministry with unhoused folks in Worcester. Welcome, Pastor Ward. Thank you so much. Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be always acceptable to you, O God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Amen. Today's scripture passage is all about the gotcha question, isn't it? The Herodians and the Pharisees are trying to trick Jesus into saying something that will benefit one side or the other. Are we going to pay taxes or not? Are we going to honor God or not? Are we going to use Roman coins that had a picture of the emperor on it? When you're not supposed to have idols, you're not supposed to have pictures like that. Of course, that kind of gotcha question is going on all around us today, right? If you look at the political situation, it's all about the gotcha question right now. From the questioning of the Supreme Court nominee, Judge Barrett, to the kind of careful misquoting of almost every TV ad on both sides. We hear questions that are designed to trap and answers that are designed to give nothing away. Now, I can go down that rabbit hole too. I voted early yesterday, I live in Worcester. So today, yesterday was the first day of voting. And I decided I needed to know a little bit more about question one. And I read articles and looked at all the materials. And you would have thought that the two sides lived in different universes. They weren't talking about any of the same things. And that's true so often right now that we find ourselves living in different universes. Now, the problem is that in a lot of ways we do live in different universes. Those who have food and shelter and healthcare and a job and those who don't have most or even any of those things those who have access to banking and credit and Wi-Fi and those who are not. As you were told, I am the director of Walking Together, a ministry with unhoused and marginally housed people in the Maine South neighborhood in Worcester. And Maine South is one of those problem neighborhoods where there are a lot of people who struggle 
and a lot of people with mental illness and a lot of people with issues with addiction. They have severe economic and social pressures and they don't have very many resources, either internally or externally to deal with them. Pre-pandemic, you know, it's hard to talk about what I do because there's this clear line as there is, you know, it's like talking about church before and after pandemic. Pre-pandemic, we welcome people to a storefront on Main Street in Worcester five days a week. And we offered hot coffee and snacks and a place to charge a cell phone, but mostly an opportunity to talk. Some people came for a few minutes. Some people would spend a big chunk of the day with us. Some slept, some paced, some played chess. We had a round robin chess tournament, the likes of which you could not imagine going on most of the time. And some people, like a lot of us, scrolled through their phones. But everyone was welcome. And everybody was recognized as a beloved child of God. We also had 12 step meetings happening five nights a week. And some of those who came in during the day came to the meetings at night and others didn't. One night when we were standing outside the storefront waiting for a meeting to begin, to begin um, a woman that I knew came walking by and I talked to her and we, we talked for a while and I invited her to come to the meeting. Just come on in, you don't have to stay. And to my delight, she came in about halfway through. And after the meeting, she came to me with tears in her eyes and said, I've been dying to come to a meeting, but I'm not sober yet. This is the fourth time you invited me. I figured that if you asked me four times, you must really mean it. We need to keep inviting people into relationship. Now, pre-pandemic at Walking Together was not the kingdom of God, okay? Just the way pre-pandemic worship at our churches was not the kingdom of God. There were arguments and occasionally even shouting matches. Sometimes there were disagreements about who took the last snack or who spilled the coffee, but there were also moments of real grace. People sharing what they could, volunteering to sweep the floor or take out the trash, people translating for me when my Spanish wasn't up to whatever the conversation was, people who watched out for the most vulnerable among us and also watched out for me and my staff and volunteers. We had a running joke, you don't touch mama's car. I get called mama by a lot of the people. And when I got a new car a couple of years, or at least new to me a couple of years ago, the people were kind of checking it out. And a couple of guys came out and said, that's mama's car, don't mess with it. I don't have to worry about some things. But one of my favorite visitors is a guy named Eric. Eric, by his own description, is schizophrenic. He's also a Kung Fu practitioner who has some seriously wonderful moves. He'll occasionally practice his kicks in the middle of the room. And he is an incredibly gentle soul. And although we know that he gives away most of the food we, that we share with him, he's very concerned about taking more than his share. So in order to both give him a little bit more food and make sure that he, he eats it, as opposed to just giving it away, and to maintain his dignity in the midst of it, we named him the official taster of walking together. If a new snack comes in or someone brings something from home, we'll say, Eric, we need you to taste it. We need a review. And he will very carefully chew it and say, it's a little crunchy. Somebody with bad teeth might have a problem with this, but it tastes really good. Or 
you know, those cookies have some ginger in them. It's really amazing what the flavor is. Now, one day my grandsons were at walking together. They were staying with me during school break and a friend dropped off some homemade cookies. The boys made a beeline for them that didn't realize it was Eric's job to taste the first one. And um, they're 10 and 12, so they each grabbed six or eight homemade cookies. None of your kids have ever done that, right? You guys don't ever grab extra cookies. And I started to tell them to put them back. We had cookies at home and some of the folks who were with us that morning had nothing. And Eric stopped me and said, Meredith, they can have mine. I don't want them to ever know what it's like to be hungry. My healthy, well-fed grandsons were more important to him than filling his own stomach. Now you know why I love Eric. Once the pandemic shut down, uh, shut us down, um, things were suddenly very different for us. My folks are particularly vulnerable. Uh, many of them either lived in shelters or in single room occupancy apartments where you rent an individual room on the floor of a house and you might share a bathroom with five or six other rooms which might have one person or a household. Usually there's just one kitchen shared by the whole building. And so social distancing was almost impossible for people. Most of the people who come to walking together also have no bank account. You remember when the stimulus checks were coming out, the first thing they did was they put them into people's bank accounts. And it was only later that people who didn't have bank accounts got a check in the mail. So the people who were most in need in my neighborhood received the money long after I got mine. I could have waited for mine. Actually, I didn't really need mine. It was really nice to get it. But folks who had almost nothing had to wait months past mine. And with no banks in the neighborhood, many took their checks to a check cashing service that takes a percentage of the check itself um, in order to access the money. And as you can probably guess, many of the folks in the neighborhood who are employed are in service jobs. They're home health aides. They're in food service. They load and unload trucks or they work day labor. Many of them were considered essential business, uh, essential workers, despite the fact that a lot of them had pre-existing vulnerabilities. Many of the folks we see are diabetic or have asthma, two conditions which are exacerbated by poor housing and limited food resources. So once we got over our denial, we spent a couple of weeks thinking, eh, we'll be back soon, right? All of us did that. We started thinking about what we could do. So we made up bags, bags of food and toiletries and bottles of water and masks. And we brought them out to people. The water was particularly important because if you're unhoused, it's really hard to get water. You wind up in a situation where you don't have a sink at home because there's no home. You can't go into the uh, bathroom of a restaurant because they were all closed. The library was closed. The city hall was closed. You couldn't get water unless you bought it. Um, drinking fountains in Worcester are about as scarce as pay phones now. They're only a tiny handful in and so buying water to wash your hands is a luxury. So I spent late last spring and early summer feeling like I was the driver of the world's weirdest ice cream truck. We would drive around the neighborhood of Maine South and 
when I saw someone I knew, I pull over to the side, I almost caused a couple accidents. And I would beat my horn to get people's attention, roll down all the windows, and we would start handing things out the window of the car. You need some water? You want a mask? You need some snacks? And we were like this clown car with all kinds of things coming out of it. We'd find folks under underpasses, walking down the street, in alleyways, in parks, and we greeted each other with love. We also um, continued Laundry Love, which some of you may have heard of. Laundry Love is a program where once a month, pre-pandemic, we would take over a laundromat and provide free laundry for anyone who came. Um, we would pay for their laundry. We'd bring pizza. We had a DJ, so it was a dance party. We had um, activities for kids, and we closed with a prayer circle. Now, post-pandemic or mid-pandemic, we couldn't gather 200 people in even the largest laundromat. And so what we do is we have gift card vouchers for the laundromat and folks get $20, uh, $20 a month to do at least some of their laundry. Um, it's not all of it. We still provide the detergent, but we can't do the dance party and we can't do the prayer circle. And we can't do the kid activities. And we can't even go in and help people fold clothes, which is where most of the best conversation comes. Because according to CDC guidelines, you wash your clothes, you dry your clothes, and you leave. You can't fold at laundromats anymore. So everything changes. We're able to meet some of people's physical needs, but we're not meeting their social needs or their emotional needs or their spiritual needs in the same way. At the moment, we're, we, the storefront is open a few days a week on a really limited basis. People can come by to us and collect snacks and water and clean socks and masks, but they can't stay long. We're working on how we might be able to be open more this winter, but to get appropriate ventilation means we have to leave the front door open, which means it's not gonna be the warmest place in the world better than outside, but not necessarily a great place. So we're looking for warm socks, frankly, and hats in neutral colors and gloves, especially those that are large enough to fit men. We need disposable hand warmers for people and Vaseline, which can take care of chapped hands and feet and chapped lips and help a multitude of problems with your skin. We're figuring out how to serve in new ways and we're always trying to be present to our folks. If we have to shut down again, we'll be back in our vehicles, probably with thermoses of hot coffee as well as bottles of water and sharing love any way we can. The week of Christmas, we're going to be either at the storefront or out with backpacks um, for everyone, full of warm hats and uh, fun foods and hygiene materials, whether we do it from a, the front door of the storefront or from the window of our car. But more than any of the stuff, let me tell you, we need your prayers. We can't do this ministry on our own energy or intelligence or strength of will. We rely on the grace of God and the prayerful support of our neighbors. My grandfather used to say, the will of God shall not lead thee where the grace of God cannot keep thee. Pray that we at Walking Together and all of us in the church at large may be attentive to the will of God and open to the grace and mercy which God offers each of us. Amen.